very, very good to you. Uh, hopefully we're going to inspire you some pictures that are currently delivering some very, very fantastic results in some research that we're doing over at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital just around the corner. Say, so my name's Bob Stone. I run a very tiny uh, team of researchers and students within the School of Electronics, Electrical and Systems Engineering at Gisbert Cap. Our overall role in the research that we do is to look at how we can introduce advanced human interfaces for systems that are particularly complex defence work that we've been doing over the last 12 years since I've been at the university through to the introduction of new interfaces to help members of the general public experience the history of the past. But I have to say nowhere in my career of 28 years being involved in the field of virtual reality have I ever come across a significant challenge as introducing new technologies into hospital settings that will deliver benefits that will improve the healthcare, the psychological and physical healthcare of people, particularly those who have undertaken or undergone very, very critical operations or have come back to the UK from, for example, Afghanistan and Iraq with life-changing life injuries. So our particular challenge, and we've been doing this in collaboration with the consultants, the clinicians, and the nurses, the physiotherapists, the patients, and the patient's relatives, over the past four years is to see how we can take the new generation of interactive technology coming out of, for example, crowdfunding sources and make, these, make the lives of these people worthwhile, make them actually feel that they can get back into mainstream communities much faster than they would have done before. And the particular challenge that we're looking at, that I'm talking about today in terms of a, a window onto a virtual world, comes from this notion of biophilia. And biophilia was a term that was introduced by Eric Fromm back in, in 1964 to emphasize the innate natural relationship that there is between the human being and things that are in nature. And more recently, well, certainly within the last 20 years, by um, Stephen Kellett and Edward Wilson, an instinctive bond between human beings and other living systems. So what we've been trying to do is trying to think of ways in which in urban hospitals, urban care homes, and urban clinics, how we can get the beauty of nature into these environments for the benefits of the human patients. And the motivation for this research came from some, from some fundamental work that was done back in the 1980s in the US by a guy called Roger Ulrich. Now what Roger did was he did a study of 46 patients who were undergoing post-operative recovery from open gallbladder surgery, cholecystectomy. And he, what, he, what he basically found was in the ward in which these patients were recovering, they had two different views. One group had a view onto a brick wall, the other group had a view onto a scene of nature, basically a collection of trees, maybe a little garden outside the hospital itself. Those who had what we call the tree view patients, those who had the view onto nature, experienced shorter post-operative stays, attracted fewer negative comments, from the nurses and the people who were looking after them, required less analgesics, and basically rated their stay in hospital as better than those that had the view onto the brick wall. Now this is quite powerful. It actually appeared in the, in the journal Science. So we thought, what can we do? and How can we build on this in order to introduce our particular technology into the hospital? And it doesn't stop there. Ever since those studies, there have been some fantastic initiatives across the world, particularly, for example, in Japan. In Japan, the, uh, what they call forest bathing, or Shinrin-yoku, is now a very, very big deal. So much so that they're actually cancelling deforestation programs of pine forests in order to make those, make those forests available for health-giving opportunities and health-giving exper experiences to those suffering from both psychological and physical conditions. What they're finding is, and it's probably not, it's, it's, it probably seems obvious, but people who go into these wonderful natural environments, their blood pressure reduces, their cortisol reduces, their heart rate reduces, it even influences their blood sugar levels. And what they're also finding, and this is a, this is a word that was developed by a, by a Russian biochemist back in 1928, is that the phytoncides, elements of nature that are being exuded by plants, can also have a positive effect on the activity of the body's natural killer cells. And these are, these are the killer cells that ward away viruses and can even suppress and prevent cancer. Now that's all well and good. Um, that's all well and good if you can get out into these pine forests or you can get into these areas, but what about those who can't? What about those who can't because they are physically injured? What about those who can't because they have psychological issues and won't get out or do not want to get out? What can we do for them? And if you look, for example, in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital just across the road, there are, there are areas within the hospital where the only view that the patients have got is of a brick wall or glass or steel. In the intensive care unit, if you, I mean, God forbid, but if you ever wake up in the intensive care unit, this is what you'll see for most of the time. 
no contact with the outside world, no real sense of time except for that clock, and certainly nothing to stimulate you. You're, you're lying there hoping to recover, uh, and, and this is the kind of view that you've got. And it doesn't really make much difference. Most urban hospitals, even those that try to put pictures on the wall, pictures on the ceiling, pictures Tiles, they all fade, they get very, very grubby after a while, and they don't achieve the effect um, that the designers first felt when they, when they were actually designed and put, in, in, put into these areas. So we thought, well, how can we introduce nature into these settings? Well, we, be, being, uh, being developers of virtual reality, we were fairly convinced that we could do this. We've already been doing um, natural scenes for bomb disposal training. So, for example, concealing improvised explosive devices within natural settings to train soldiers where to look for these particularly nasty devices. And we've done a lot of work in the area of coastal heritage. So we were quite convinced that we could do this. So these are our research questions. By using virtual reality, can we achieve exactly the same effects in a hospital setting or a care home setting that were demonstrated by Roger Ulrich back in the 1980s. Can we introduce this technology into hospital and actually look at the impact on things like delirium, sleep quality, and so on and so forth? So to do this, what we've done is we've chosen two areas, two areas in the southwest of the country, and uh, I, there's no scientific reason for this. You can probably tell from my accent that that's where I was born and bred, and taking my students down to Devon uh, is, always goes down very, very well with the researchers. So we've chosen two areas, virtual burrow tour in the top, which is where um, Steven Spielberg farm film, a part of his film War Horse, and virtual Wembury, which is a coastal path just around the corner from Plymouth. To actually build these worlds, and very, very briefly, you can get more information on my website, what we do is we take digital terrain map data from the web, aerial photography data from the web, we merge these in a typical um, virtual reality or gaming package, we then purchase a whole range of um, assets, be they three-dimensional buildings, plants, whatever, and then we completely uh, endow this, this virtual world with as much virtual nature as we can, backing up um, the, uh, the surveys that we carry out on site with some of our quadcopter and hexacopter technologies. That sounds like, uh, that sounds the background like a, uh, a, a, an audience at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a film show or an audience at a, um, at a, at a football game, that's actually running water. But just a few, just to give you a couple of seconds of the, the kind of images that we're presenting to the patients. This is a five kilometer, five kilometer by five kilometer area of, of Wembley that we've been modeling um, for the patients. This is currently in Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which I'll touch on in a second. And then we have a much more forested area representing the, the Baratour Reservoir uh, area of, um, of, of Dartmoor, just north of, north, north of Plymouth. The, the sounds of the wind, the sounds of the nature, the sounds of the water, we've got different kinds of creatures in there. All these sounds are coming together in the hope that this will have a major impact on the recovery rates of the individuals within hospital. So the early research that we've been carrying out, we've been carrying out with, um, obviously, with, 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 healthy, with healthy participants, we've been carrying it out with the amputees that have been coming back off operational duty, and we've been carrying out with, with, with a number of very, very bold, very, very, um, very, very uh, sort of brave individuals who, who are offering to help us in the intensive care area. And we, we give, I give credit to those people today for volunteering to help us evaluate this for the benefit of future patients. So, so, for example, do we need high fidelity? Do we need a lot of realism in the, um, in the virtual worlds that we're presenting to these people? Probably not. We keep, our, we keep our virtual worlds very bright, not high detail, because, of course, a lot of these people are on drugs, and if you went to the detail of giving them something very, very photorealistic, they probably wouldn't benefit from it anyway. What about auditory fidelity, the, the incorporation of sound? In, introducing sound into virtual worlds completely revolutionizes, not, revolutionizes the experience. What about interface technologies? What do we give the people to be able to explore these worlds? Each patient brings with him his or her own capabilities and limitations, and we have to take those into concern, into concern uh, with, from an ergonomics point of view for blast damage patients, burns patients, amputees, and those in critical care. And with the technology, there's also the issue of bedside ergonomics. The patients need the relatives to visit them. The nurses, the physiotherapists need to be able to get to the patients in order to carry out significant amounts of, of, of support. And we also have to involve the nursing staff uh, in, in order to help with the interaction and help them learn how to exploit the technology for the benefit of the patients. So very, very briefly, um, we have two of these systems currently undergoing evaluations within the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, we've, uh, we're looking at it from both an interactive technology point of view and using a range of established clinical procedures and clinical um, uh, techniques. We're looking at the impact 
of providing the people with short sequences of this window onto a virtual world and the impact that has on, for example, delirium, their stay, and, and, and for example, their sleep quality. And in terms of the near-term future investigations, we're taking it another stage further. We're developing, the students are developing new forms of breathing interfaces, spirometers, which will enable people to actually breathe and, inf and that will in influence their movements through the virtual world and encourage them to come off mechanical ventilators far sooner than is currently the case. If we can do that and release beds in intensive care so they can go on to mainstream wards, then we're very, very much on the, uh, on, on the verge of a major breakthrough. And we're even looking into smell. Um, possibly not in intensive care, but can we, can we introduce the smell of pine, these magical phytoncides that I talked about very early on? Again, very much a research issue that we're, we're, we're very, very excited to pursue. And what about dementia? Dementia care homes. We're currently building a, a real window on the world in order to take this technology and see whether or not it will actually influence or help the uh, patients suffering from early onset dementia. So that's the we're doing within the School of Electro and Electrical Engineering. Um, virtual reality is, 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 has come under a lot of bad press over the last 10 to 15 years, but we think finally we found some kind of route where it will deliver immediate benefit to some patients in some very, 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 very difficult psychological and, and physical conditions. And by doing so, we hope that for those patients that cannot travel the path that we're talking about today are able through the magic of virtual reality to do just that and then hopefully have their psychological and physical problems restored to a level where they can lead full and healthy lives. Thank you for watching. Thank you for coming. I hope that's started the day off well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.